Charles Dickens I hope for the enlargement of my mind and for the improvement of my understanding. If I have done but little good, I trust I have done less harm, and that none of my adventures will be other than a source of amusing and pleasant recollection. God bless you all. Pickwick the path of progress in certain problems seems barred as by a flaming sword. More than a thousand years before Christ, an Arab chief asked, If a man die, shall he live again? Every man who ever lived has asked the same question, but we know no more today about the subject than did Job. There are 105 boy babies born to every 100 girls. The law holds in every land where vital statistics have been kept, and Sari Gamp knew just as much about the cause why as Brown Sicard, Pasteur, Agnew or Austin Flint. There is still a third question that every parent, since Adam and Eve, has sought to solve. How can I educate this child so that he will attain eminence? And even in spite of shelves that groan beneath tomes and tomes, and advice from a million preachers, the answer is, nobody knows. There is a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. Moses was sent adrift, but the tide carried him into power. The brethren of Joseph deposited it into a cavity, but you cannot dispose of genius that way. Demosthenes was weighted, or blessed, with every disadvantage. Shakespeare got into difficulty with a woman eight years his senior, stole deer, ran away, and became the very first among English poets. Erasmus was a foundling. Once there was a woman by the name of Nancy Hanks. She was thin-breasted, gaunt, yellow, and sad. At last, living in poverty, overworked, she was stricken by death. She called her son, homely as herself, and pointing to the lad's sister, said, Be good to her, Abe, and died, died having no expectation for her boy beyond the hope that he might prosper in worldly affairs so as to care for himself and his sister. The boy became a man who wielded wisely a power mightier than that ever given to any other American. Seven college-bred men composed his cabinet, and Proctor Knott once said that, if a teeter were evenly balanced, and the members of the cabinet were all placed on one end, and the president on the other, he would send the seven wise men flying into space. On the other hand, Marcus Aurelius wrote his meditations for a son who did not read them, and whose name is a symbol of profligacy. Charles Kingsley penned Greek heroes for offspring who have never shown their father's heroism, and Charles Dickens wrote A Child's History of England for his children, none of whom has proven his proficiency in historiology. Charles Dickens himself received his education at the University of Hard Knocks. Very early in life, he was cast upon the rocks and suckled by the she-wolf. Yet he became the most popular author the world has ever known, and up to the present time no writer of books has approached him in point of number of readers and of financial returns. These are facts. Facts so hard and true that they would be the delight of Mr. Gradgrind. At twelve years of age, Charles Dickens was pasting labels on blacking boxes. His father was in prison. At sixteen, he was spending odd hours in the reading room of the British Museum. At nineteen, he was parliamentary reporter. At twenty-one, a writer of sketches. At twenty-three, he was getting a salary of thirty-five dollars a week, and the next year his pay was doubled. When twenty-five, he wrote a play that ran for seventy nights at Drury Lane Theater. About the same time, he received $700 for a series of sketches written in two weeks. At 26, publishers were at his feet. When Dickens was at the flood tide of prosperity, Thackeray, one year his senior, waited on his doorstep with pictures to illustrate Pickwick. He worked steadily and made from eight to $25,000 a year. His fame increased, and the New York Ledger paid him $10,000 for one story which he wrote in a fortnight. His collected works fill 40 volumes. There are more of Dickens' books sold every year now than in any year in which he lived. There were more of Dickens' books sold last year than any previous year. I am glad that the public buys his books, says MacReady, for if they did not, he would take to the stage and eclipse us all. Not So Bad As We Seem, by Bulwer-Lytton, was played at Devonshire House in the presence of the Queen, Dickens taking the principal part. He gave theatrical performances in London, Liverpool, and Manchester for the benefit of Lee Hunt, Sheridan Knowles, and various other needy authors and actors. He wrote a dozen plays, and twice as many more have been constructed from his plots. He gave public readings through England, Scotland, and Ireland, where the people fought for seats. The average receipts for these entertainments were $800 per night. In 1863, he made a six-months tour of the United States, giving a series of readings. 
the prices of admission were placed at extravagant figures but the box office was always besieged until the ticket seller put out his lights and hung out a sign the standing room is all taken the gross receipts of these readings were two hundred twenty nine thousand dollars the expenses thirty nine thousand dollars net profit one hundred ninety thousand dollars charles dickens died of brain rupture in eighteen hundred seventy aged fifty eight his dust rests in westminster abbey to know the london of dickens is a liberal education once said james t fields who was affectionately referred to by charles dickens as massachusetts jemmy and i am aware of no better way to become acquainted with the greatest city in the world than to follow the winding footsteps of the author of david copperfield beginning his london life when ten years of age he shifted from one lodging to another zigzag tacking back and forth from place to place but all the time making head and finally dwelling in palaces of which nobility might be proud it took him forty-eight years to travel from the squalor of camden town to poet's corner in westminster abbey he lodged first in bayham street a washerwoman lived next door and a bow street officer over the way it was a shabby district chosen by the elder dickens because the rent was low as he neglected to pay the rent one wonders why he did not take quarters in piccadilly i looked in vain for a sign reading wash and done here but i found a bow street officer who told me that bayham street had long since disappeared yet there is always a recompense in prowling about london because if you do not find the thing you are looking for you find something else equally interesting my bow street friend proved to be a regular magazine of rare and useful information historical archaeological and biographical a london bobby has his clothes cut after a pattern a hundred years old and he always carries his gloves in his hand never wearing them because this was a habit of william the conqueror but never mind he is intelligent courteous and obliging and i am perfectly willing that he should wear skirts like a ballet dancer and a helmet too small if it is his humor my policeman knew an older officer who was acquainted with mr dickens mr dickens at a fur policeman suit himself issued to him on an order from scotland yard and he used to do patrol duty at night carrying his bloomin gloves in his hand and his chin strap in place this was told me by my new-found friend who volunteered to show me the way to north gower street it's only gower street now and the houses have been renumbered so number four is a matter of conjecture but my guide showed me a door where were the marks of a full-grown plate that evidently had long since disappeared some days afterward i found this identical brass plate at an old bookshop in cheapside the plate read mrs dickens establishment the man who kept the place advertised himself as a bibliopole he offered to sell me the plate for one pun ten but i did not purchase for i knew where i could get its mate with a deal more verdigree all for six and eight Dickens has recorded that he cannot recollect of any pupils coming to the establishment, but he remembers when his father was taken, like Mr. Dorrit, to the debtor's prison. He was lodged in the top story but one, in the very same room where his son afterwards put the Dorrits. It's a queer thing to know that a book writer can imprison folks without a warrant, and even kill them, and yet go unpunished, which thought was suggested to me by my philosophic guide. From this house in Gower Street, Charles used to go daily to the Marshalsea to visit Micawber, who not so many years later was to act as the proud amanuensis of his son. The next morning, after I first met Bobby, he was off duty. I met him by appointment at the Three Jolly Beggars, a place pernicious snug. He was dressed in a fashionable, light-colored suit, the coat a trifle short, and a high silk hat. His large red neck-scarf, set off by his bright, brick-dust complexion, caused me to mistake him at first for a friend of mine who drives a Holborn bus. Mr. Hawkins, for it was he, greeted me cordially, pulling gently at his neck-whiskers, and when he addressed me as Milud, the barmaid served us with much alacrity and things. We went first to the Church of St. George, then we found Angel Court leading to Bermondsey, and also Marshalsea Place. Here is the site of the prison, where the crowded ghosts of misery still hover, but small trace could we find of the prison itself. Neither did we see the ghosts. We, however, saw a very pretty barmaid at the public in Angel Court. I think she is still prettier than the one to whom Bobby introduced me at the sign of the meat axe, which is saying a good deal. Angel Court is rightly named. The Blacking Warehouse at Old Hungerford Stairs, Strand, in which Charles Dickens was shown by Bob Fagan how to tie up the pots of paste, has rotted down and been carted away. 
the coal barges in the muddy river are still there just as they were when charles paul green and bob fagan played on them during the dinner hour i saw bob and several other boys grimy with blacking chasing each other across the flatboats but dickens was not there down the river a ways there is a crazy old warehouse with a rotten wharf of its own abutting on the water when the tide is in and on the mud when the tide is out the whole place literally overrun with rats that scuffle and squeal on the mouldy stairs i asked bobby if it could not be that this was the blacking factory but he said no for this one all us was dickens found lodging in lant street while his father was awaiting in the marshalsea for something to turn up bob sawyer afterward had the same quarters when sawyer invited mr pickwick and the other chaps to dine with him he failed to give his number so we cannot locate the house but i found the street and saw a big wooden pickwick on wheels standing as a sign for a tobacco shop the old gentleman who runs the place and runs the sign in every night assured me that bob sawyer's room was the first floor back i looked in at it but seeing no one was there whom i knew i bought tuppence worth of pigtail in lieu of fee and came away if a man wished to abstract himself from the world to remove himself from temptation to place himself beyond the possibility of desire to look out of the window he should live in lant street said a great novelist David Copperfield lodged here when he ordered that glass of genuine stunning ale at the Red Lion and excited the sympathy of the landlord, winning a motherly kiss from his wife. The Red Lion still crouches, under another name, at the corner of Derby and Parliament Streets, Westminster. I daydreamed there for an hour one morning, pretending the while to read a newspaper. I cannot, however, recommend their ale as particularly stunning. As there are authors of one book, so there are readers of one author, more than we wist. Children want the same bear story over and over, preferring it to a new one. So grown-ups often prefer the dog-eared book to uncut leaves. Mr. Hawkins preferred the dog-eared, and at the station house, where many times he had long hours to wait in anticipation of a hurry-up call, he whiled away the time by browsing in his dickens. He knew no other author, neither did he wish to. His epidermis was soaked with dickensology and when inspired by gin and bitters he emitted information at every pore to him all these bodiless beings of dickens brain were living creatures an anachronism was nothing to hawkins charlie bates was still at large quilp was just around the corner and gaffer hexam's boat was moored in the muddy river below dickens used to haunt the publics those curious resting places where all sorts and conditions of thirsty philosophers meet to discuss all sorts of themes my guide took me to many of these inns, which the great novelist frequented, and we always had one legend with every drink. After we had called at three or four different snuggeries, Hawkins would begin to shake out the facts. Now it is not generally known that the so-called stories of Dickens are simply records of historic events, like what do you call em's plays. For instance, Dombey and Son was a well-known firm who carried over into a joint stock company only a few years ago. The concern is now known as the Dombey Trading Company. They occupy the same quarters that were used by their illustrious predecessors. I signified a desire to see the counting-house so minutely described by Dickens, and Mr. Hawkins agreed to pilot me thither on our way to Tavistock Square. We twisted down to the first turning, then up three, then straight ahead to the first right-hand turn, where we cut to the left until we came to a stuffed dog, which is the sign of a glover just beyond this my guide plucked me by the sleeve we halted and he silently and solemnly pointed across the street sure enough there it was the warehouse with a great stretch of dirty windows in front through which we could see dozens of clerks bending over ledgers just as though mr dombey were momentarily expected over the door was a gilt sign the bombay trading company bobby explained that it was all the same I did not care to go in, but at my request Hawkins entered and asked for Mr. Carker, the junior, but no one knew him. Then we dropped in at the Silver Shark, a little inn about the size of a large dustbin, of two compartments and a sifter. Here we rested a bit, as we had walked a long way. The barmaid who waited upon us was in curl papers, but she was even then as pretty, if not prettier, than the barmaid at the public in Angel Court, and that is saying a good deal. She was about as tall as Trilby, or as Ellen Terry, which is a very nice height, I think. As we rested, Mr. Hawkins told the barmaid and me how Rogue Riderhood came to this very public through that same doorway just after he had his Alfred David took down by the governor's both. He was a slouching dog, was the rogue. He wore an old sodden fur cap, winter and summer, formless and mangy. It looked like a drowned cat. His hands were always in his pockets up to his elbows when they were not reaching for something, and when he was out after game his walk was a half-shuffle and run. Hawkins saw him starting off this way one night and followed him, knowing there was mischief on hand, 
followed him for two hours through the fog and rain it was midnight and the last stroke of the bells that told the hour had ceased and their echo was dying away when all at once but the story is too long to relate here it is so long that when mr hawkins had finished it was too late to reach tavistock square before dark mr hawkins explained that as bats and owls and rats come out only when the sun has disappeared so there are other things that can be seen best by night and as he did not go on until the next day at one he proposed that we should go down to the cheshire cheese and get a bite of summit and then sally forth so we hailed a bus and climbed to the top she rolls like a scow in the wake of a liner said bobby as we tumbled into seats when the bus man came up the little winding ladder and jingled his punch hawkins paid our fares with a heavy wink and the guard said thank you sir and passed on <laughs> 